Welcome again to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. I'm Brenda Wood. Tonight's presentation, What About Modern Prophets, is a question many people have. What about the people who claim to be prophets of God, such as Gene Dixon, Edgar Cayce, Bridie Murphy, and Ruth Montgomery? Are these people really prophets of God? What about the gift of prophecy mentioned in the Bible? Can we trust the horoscope or the zodiac? What does the scripture have to say about these different means and methods people use to attempt to find out what the future holds? Let's join Pastor Cox as he answers these and other fascinating questions in his topic, What About Modern Prophets? Thank you, Shirley. I'm very happy to welcome each of you back again this evening. Every time in the history of mankind, when people have been unsure, there hasn't been a clear, distinct voice. They haven't been able to hear someone say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And they haven't been clear on what they were to do. In every case, man has turned to the supernatural, hoping that somehow he might get some kind of guidance, some direction, and we are living in an age where people are seeking the supernatural, hoping that it will give them some kind of guidance and direction, that there might be some clear, distinct voice that would be telling them which way to go, what to do. That's the time that we're living in today. Many people have turned to witches. Others have turned to the horoscope zodiac, to the reading of the stars, to cards, all kinds of different ways hoping that the supernatural might give them some kind of a direction and guidance for their life. The scripture has some very clear, very pointed words to tell us about this, and this is what it says. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels, let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that should come upon thee. God said, if these people that claim to be able to read the stars that write this monthly article in the paper or the weekly or daily or whatever they're writing, he said, if these people can save you, stand up said, if you can do, do something, if you can tell men and women what's going to happen, you can save them, stand up. Speaking of one of the kings of Israel, says, and he made his sons pass through the fire, observed times, used enchantments, and dealt with mediums and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Says that this king sought all kinds of spiritual medium trying to find answers, and it says that it provoked the Lord. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. God tells us clearly that you and I don't need to be seeking individuals that claim to be able to read the future. It says don't do that then how am I to relate? How am I to regard such things as prophecy? What does God expect me to do? Well, listen very clearly. It says here in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, do not quench the what? Spirit. Now, it says that you and I are not to quench the Spirit, and tonight... I'm going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit. You'll find that the Bible talks about some people that quench the Spirit. It talks about some people that grieve the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be preaching two more sermons on the Holy Spirit. And we're going to deal one time with why people don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And one reason they don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit is because they quench the Spirit. And another reason is because many people grieve the Holy Spirit. We're going to take a look at those. But it says, don't quench the Spirit. I'll go into that later. All right. 
It says, do not despise what? Yes, it says, don't despise prophecy. It tells you and I that we're not to despise prophecy. Therefore, how am I to relate it when God says that I'm not to seek unto those that have familiar spirits? How can I know whether a person is a prophet of God? What about people like Gene Dixon, Edgar Casey, Patty Murphy, Ruth Montgomery? Do I know if those people are prophets of God or not? How can I know that for sure? Now, he tells you how you can know. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Now, it says don't despise prophecy, but it says test all things. How are you going to test it? Huh? Only one way you can test it, and that's in this book. You're going to have to go to God's Word, and you're going to have to know what the book says. That must become my guide. That must become my rule. That must become my standard. That must guide me in everything I do. That's the way I can know whether it's of God or whether it's not. He said, hold fast that which is good. Now, the Scripture gives us some real clear uh, counsel telling us how to relate to people who claim to be prophets. I want you to listen to what it says here in Deuteronomy. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, here comes this person, they say, I'm a prophet. They not only tell you they are a prophet, they give you a sign. They say, this is going to happen, okay? And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Boy, they say, this is going to happen, and it happens just exactly like they say. It comes to pass. Whereof he spoke unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Now, here comes somebody along. They say, I'm a prophet. They tell you this is going to happen, and it happens just like they say. And then they try to lead you away from God or contrary to Scripture, listen to what the Lord says. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God testeth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, this person said they were a prophet. They gave you a sign. It happened just like they said, and then they tried to lead you contrary to God's word. The Lord said, don't believe them. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. So God is telling you and I very clearly, dear friends, if a person claims to be a prophet, they must be in harmony with this book. And if they are not in harmony with this book, they are not a prophet of God. That I can know. And I don't care who the individual is. If they do not agree with the word of God, you better believe I'm going to stay with the Word of God. I can't always believe what I see. I can't always believe what I hear. But I can believe the Word of God. That I can. Now, he also goes on and says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto, unto those who ha are mediums, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, should they seek on behalf of the living to the dead? Now, it says if people claim to be able to talk to the dead, they seek after wizards or fortune tellers or somebody hoping to give some kind of direction, listen to what the very next verse says. That's verse 19. Listen to what verse 20 says. to the law and to the testimony. When it says to the law and the testimony, it's talking about this book. To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. God said they must be in agreement with the word of God. I'm trying to get across to you tonight, friends, is your security, 
is in God's Word. Stick with it. Don't let somebody come along and tell you that something else other than what God's Word says in regard to your religious belief, in regard to your relationship with Jesus Christ. It says in Revelation 16, verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of what? Dragon. You found out who the dragon was. Okay? All right? Unclean spirit come out of the mouth of the dragon. Out of the mouth of the beast, you found out who the beast was, right? And out of the mouth of the false prophet. And we're going to talk about that before we're through. So it's talking about this unclean spirit coming out. Listen to what they do. For they are the spirits of what? Deeming, demons, they're spirits of demons working signs in the old English, and it's correct in that aspect. It is miracles. It says working miracles which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is the devil is capable of working miracles. Just because there is a miracle doesn't necessarily mean that miracle is from God. It must be in harmony with the Word of God. That's why you find throughout the Scripture God has given people counsel time and time again about how to relate to people who claim to have the gift of prophecy and who claim to do these type of things. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but what? Test the spirits. Now, I hope you've learned how do you test the spirits. Come on, how do you test the spirits? By the Scripture. All right, that's what it's saying. But test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So I've got to go to the Word of God and I've got to make sure this is what God's Word is teaching. Now, how am I? as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, to relate to prophecy. The Scripture gives us some counsel there. It says, They arose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be what? Established. Oh, that some people would just learn that. There's some people that never in their life have they ever settled the question. Never in their life have they ever come and said, I'm settled, I believe the Scripture, I believe what it says, I believe in God, that's settled once and for all for me. God said if they would do that, they would be established. Not being tossed around all the time. He said they need to make up their mind, they need to settle the question once and for all. And then it says... Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. It's very true. Believe God's prophets, so ye shall prosper. You see, God has had prophets all the way down through time. The Scripture says that Enoch, the eighth from Adam, was a prophet. He prophesied about the coming of the Lord. Of course, it tells us that Noah was a prophet. Moses was a prophet of God. Daniel, we've studied some of his prophecies. He was a prophet of God. Elijah, Elisha, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. All these men were prophets of God. Did you know there were men that were prophets of God that never wrote a word of Scripture? Did you know that? Yes. You can read about them. They were men that were prophets of God that never wrote a word of Scripture but they were prophets of God. When we get to the New Testament, it says that John the Baptist, Jesus himself said John the Baptist was one of the greatest of the prophets. Paul was a prophet of God. We've studied some of his prophecies. John the Revelator was a prophet of God. And there were men in the New Testament that never wrote a word of Scripture that were prophets, like Agabus was a prophet of God, but he never wrote any Scripture. Okay. 
What is the purpose of the prophet? Listen to what it says here in Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So it says that God reveals unto the prophets things that are going to happen, things that are to come. That's the work of a prophet. Now, not only are there men in the Bible that were prophets, but you'll find that the Bible also talks about women that were prophetess. I run on some people that think the only thing that a woman's supposed to do is to sit down in church and keep her mouth shut. That's right. Some people believe that. I don't find my Bible teaching that. And it tells me clearly that there were women that were prophetess of God. Did you know that Moses had a sister? You know what her name was? Her name was Miriam. She also had a brother other than Moses. Did you know that? What was his name? Aaron. All right, I want you to listen to what the Scripture says about her. It says, and Miriam, the what? The prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. This is after they crossed the Red Sea. And Pharaoh and his army had tried to follow them, and they had been drowned in the Red Sea. And it says that Miriam and the women of Israel went out and danced before the Lord, and it says that Miriam prophesied about the coming of Jesus. She was a prophetess of God. Have you ever read about Deborah? Huh? She was a prophetess. That's what it says about her. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapdoeth, judged Israel at that time. She was a prophetess of God, used by God, and under her leadership, they were delivered from the bondage of the Philistines. Have you ever read about Huldah? What it says here, and Hilkiah and they whom the king had appointed went to Huldah, the what? The prophetess. She was a prophetess of God. No, not only were there women in the Old Testament that were prophetess of God, but there were women in the New Testament. You ever read about Anna? Yeah. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Azur, she was of great age, had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. You remember a deacon in the early church by the name of Philip? You remember him? Did you know that the Bible says he had four daughters and they were all prophetess? That's what it says. So you find that there were men and women all the way through this book that were prophets and prophetess that were used by God in a very special way. Now, the work of a prophet, the Scripture talks about. In fact, it outlines it very clearly in the book of 1 Corinthians here, and I want to make something clear. Let me tell you something. The gift of prophecy didn't stop with the disciples. Now, I run on some people that want to think that all the gifts of the Spirit ended with the disciples. No way. And here in 1 Corinthians, he's given us some guidance about spiritual gifts, and he says... But he who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. So it says the work of a person who is a prophet is one, is for edification. Most of us don't mind being edified as long as someone doesn't overdo it, you know, too much. But it says that the work of a prophet is also for exhortation. Most of us don't like to be exhorted very much. When I first went in the ministry, I thought that was the work of a preacher. Because I'd read in the Old Testament where it said, Stand on the walls of Zion and show my people their sins. And so, man, I'd get up on Sabbath and would wax eloquently on the sins of the people. I mean, I really let them have it. And I can remember this one week, I was really letting them have it. I mean, I was telling them what was wrong with them. And when I finished, there was an old minister in the congregation, and he came up front and visited with me a little bit, and he said, could I share something with you? And I said, sure. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, you can shear your sheep often, but you can only skin them once. <laughs> Boy, I began to learn. 
A great, great difference there. Sure, we not, all of us, I guess, need to be exhorted once in a while, but it also says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. You see, the work of a prophet is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's the work they're to do. Now, these spiritual gifts that the Bible talks about, those spiritual gifts were given on the day of Pentecost. And it says that they're poured out upon the church today. And I can tell you, there are many Christians, many individuals, that their whole Christian experience is not very alive. It's depleted because they have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you right now, dear friends, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I not only believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe in all nine gifts of the Spirit. And many people's witness is ineffective because they've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to listen to what it says about these spiritual gifts. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Paul's right, and he said, I'm going to give you some information about spiritual gifts. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for mutual profit. So it says that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is given to each one of us, the gifts that are given, is given to us for mutual profit. Now listen carefully. For to one is given the word of wisdom by the Spirit. That's one gift. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. That's another gift that's given. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, the gift of healings by the same Spirit. These are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. To another, the working of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the discerning of spirits. And to another, different kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Those are all gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. Listen very carefully because there's some people that miss the next part. But one and the same self-spirit works all these things, dividing to each one what? Individually as he wills. Did you notice that word he is capitalized? That means according to the Holy Spirit's will. Now, I want to get something real clear tonight. You do not, you are not supposed to be praying and asking the Holy Spirit to give you the gift of tongues. I find people getting down and praying and say, Lord, please give me the gift of tongues. No. You and I are to be praying and we're to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and it's up to the Holy Spirit to give us whatever gift he wants to give us. It says it is up to him that he gives to individuals as he wills, not as we will. The Holy Spirit knows what gift you need, and he will give you the gift that you need. That is what makes your witness effective. This thing of getting down and saying, give me the gift of tongues, no. The Holy Spirit might give you the gift of tongues. I believe in the gift of tongues. But I believe it's the work of the Holy Spirit to give us what gift he wants us to have. That's what it says clearly. I want you to look at these gifts with me very quickly. It says to one is given the gift of wisdom. I have known, still know a lot of people who have had very little formal education but I believe they have the gift of wisdom. I believe the Holy Spirit has given them the, that gift. In fact, when I need counsel, those are the type of people I look for. You can talk all the book learning you want to talk and all the education in the world you want to talk, but I can tell you right now, if that person doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ and they haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to go to them for counsel. I'm going to go to somebody that I believe God has given the gift of wisdom to. It says to others, is given the gift of knowledge. That's another gift. In fact, I believe I roomed with a boy in school that had the gift of knowledge. 
we, I can still remember, we'd be studying Greek, and I would be sitting there at the desk poring over the Greek book trying to learn Greek, and he would sit on the bed with his guitar, and he would strum his guitar and page through that Greek book. We'd take tests, and he'd make A's, and I'd make B's. I mean, he seems, he's still a close friend to this day, and I could go out here and call him on the telephone right now, and he's just like an encyclopedia. I can ask him dates, places, and stuff, and he can just peel it off. I mean, he just seems to have the gift of knowledge. But I can tell you when I need counsel, I don't go to him because he doesn't have horse sense. There's a great, great difference between wisdom and knowledge. You see, but that's a gift, the gift of knowledge. To others, is given the gift of faith. And I'm sure you know people who seem to have the gift of faith that is bigger than normal. They just have a faith that is a gift of God. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit. To others, is given the gift of healings. And I want to tell you right now, I believe in divine healing. You wouldn't convince me in 10,000 years that God doesn't heal. I've seen it too many times. I can still remember I was holding a meeting in Louisville, Kentucky. A girl about 13 years old, and that's been back in, oh, 75. So it's been, what, uh, 13 years ago, and she was probably 12, 13 at that time. She came to me after I had spoken one night on this subject, and she said, Brother Cox, I have a very serious uh, problem. She said, I have a kidney disorder. And she said, when these meetings are over, my parents are taking me to Mayo's uh, to have them work on me. And she said, uh, I'm wondering if you'd pray for me. And I said, I'd be glad to. In fact, I said, the scripture says in the book of James, if there's any sick among you, let them call the elders of the church, anoint that person with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And I said, if you want me to, I'll have the elders come and we'll anoint you and pray for you. And she said, I would greatly appreciate it. We anointed that young lady and prayed for her. Meeting finished. When it was over, her parents took her to Mayo's. They got up there. They checked in. The next morning, they started taking her through the clinic. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the doctors called her parents in and they said, uh, we want to know why you brought her here. And they said, we brought her here because she has a very serious kidney problem. And the doctor said, we can't find any evidence of it. And the mother said, fine, I'll take her home. And the, parent, and the doctor said, no, you won't. They said, we know she has a kidney problem. And the way we know it is because the file you brought here from your doctor. And they had a file about that thick on her. And they said, what's bothering us in the file, it shows that she has been operated on once before for this kidney problem, and we can't even find scars. That girl writes me every Christmas. She's married, has two children. You won't, can, you just, no way you convince me that God doesn't heal. He means exactly what he says. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't believe in doctors. I believe in doctors. To me, it doesn't make much difference to me whether God decides to heal naturally through a doctor or supernaturally. As far as I'm concerned, it's all the Lord. The doctor's just helping a little bit. That's all. So, it, but he says that he heals, and I believe that. Also, it says to some are given the gift of miracles, and I believe that there are some people that have the gift of miracles. Have you ever known anybody that has? Huh? I have. I have a friend that I believe has that gift because every time I get around him, I walk sideways because something strange is going to happen. It's just... You know, that's just the way it is. It seems to have that gift. To others, it says to them, is given the gift of prophecy. They're able to see. God shows them things that are going to happen, things that are going to take place. To others, it says, is given the gift of discerning of spirits. In other words, they can discern whether the spirit that is present is of God or whether it's not of the Lord. They have that ability. To others, is given the gift of tongues. And I told you, I believe in tongues. But I'm going to show you in a minute that it's not like a lot of people believe. 
I will tell you right now, it is not a yibbish. I can tell you that for sure. And the Scripture gives us some very, very clear counsel about the use of tongues, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. And it says to others is given the interpretation of tongues. Those are nine gifts. Those gifts are given to help you and I in our witness. But please understand, dear friend, that any one of these gifts is manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't let anybody sell you a bit of bill of goods and tell you that you've got to speak in tongues before you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's absolutely contrary to Scripture. Any one of those gifts is evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, there's millions of people in this country that have been told things concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is not scriptural and is not right. And they've been sold a bill of goods that they need to look at carefully. Sure, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe in all nine gifts. But I can tell you right now, I'm going to follow it like the Bible says. Paul gives us some counsel about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Listen. I wished you all spoke with tongues. Paul said, be nice if all of you could speak with tongues. But even more that you prophesied, he said, better yet that you had the gift of prophecy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless he interprets that the church may receive edification. Now, I hope you're catching what Paul is saying. He's saying for me to stand up and speak in a tongue and the church can't understand it, I'm not helping anybody. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? He said, if I'm speaking to you in a tongue, I've got to either help you some way if you don't understand what I'm saying. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. See, if I stand up here tonight and speak to you in Swahili, you're not going to understand me. I'm not going to help you. It's not going to be of benefit to any of you. Okay? Kurt stood out here tonight and told you that we're starting down in Newport Beach. And he told you we're going every night, and that's right, for six weeks. And he said, come down. But I, he didn't tell you that three nights out of the week I'm going to be having the meeting in Spanish. And if you don't understand, understand Spanish, it won't do you any good. Okay? You've got to speak in a language so people can understand you. That's what it's saying, all right? If anyone speaks in a tongue, now get it clear. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most, what? Three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Are you understanding what Paul's saying? He's saying, now, if somebody's going to speak in a tongue, let it be one, two, or three people at the very most. And he said, let, one, let them do it one at a time. That's what it means when it says each in turn. It says none of this stuff of 15 people all on their feet, all speaking in an unknown tongue at the same time. There is nothing godly about that. That is absolutely chaos, and that is disorder, and that is not pleasing to God. You understand me? He said one, two, or three, and each in turn. Okay? Now, I've been to these meetings where I've seen all kinds of people standing up and all speaking in an unknown tongue. That is absolute bedlam. And I also have been to these meetings where I have seen one person stand up and speak in a tongue, and when they finished, the minister stood up and said, is there anybody here that can interpret that? That also is not in accordance with Scripture. 
Now listen carefully because the next verse tells you it's not. But if there is no interpreter, let him what? Keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. You see, it says before that individual ever stands up and speaks in a tongue, they're to know there's an interpreter there. You see, the gift of interpretation is just as real a gift as the gift of tongues is. Before that person ever stands up and speaks in the tongue, they're to know that there's somebody there that can interpret, and if there's nobody there that can interpret it, then they need to keep quiet, and they need to pray to themselves and to God. That's what the Scripture is saying. Now, the Scripture also tells us that in the last days that the gift of prophecy is going to be manifested in a very special way. I believe that all nine gifts, I believe that all nine gifts are to be present in God's church. I believe that all nine gifts are to make us effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. And dear friend, if you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then I'll tell you tonight, you need to be praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when I speak on the subject, why many do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to be here. I'll tell you that for sure. But it says here, it will come to pass in the last days. That's down in the days we're living in. It says, God, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So it says the gift of prophecy is going to be very manifested. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And on my men's servant and on my maid servants I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they will prophesy. So God says very clearly that in the last days, the gift of prophecy is going to be manifested in a marked manner. That's what the Scripture promises. God speaks to his church in the last days. Revelation 12, we studied that the other night. Verse 17 says, And the dragon was enraged. Who's the dragon? The devil, right. It says the devil, the dragon, the serpent. Okay. The dragon was enraged with the woman. The woman's who? The church. So it says that the devil is mad at the church and went to make war with the rest of her what? Offspring. That means the remnant. That means... The last part, right down at the end of time. God's people down at the end of time, it says the devil's mad at you. Some of you have never recognized that. I can tell you right now, the devil's unhappy with you. And he's going to give you all the trouble he can give you. Now, let me tell you, you don't need to be concentrating on the devil. You don't need to worry about him. He's a defeated foe. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. But when you run into problems, you can understand the old devil's after it. All right? So it says, He went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it says very clearly that God's people down at the end, that they're going to do what? They're going to keep God's commandments. And when it says they'll keep God's commandments, that happens to be all ten of them, not just nine of them. It says God's people will keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I understand the commandments of God. What does it mean by the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, Revelation 19 and verse 10 says, I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. There's that statement. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? So it says that the church in the last days keep God's commandments and the gift of prophecy will be manifested in a marked way in God's church. That's what it's saying. You want to know what's right? Okay, we're dealing with what's right. That you and I can know. All right, I believe, I believe that was manifested in a special way in the writings of a woman by the name of Ellen G. White. I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. As a young girl, 
nine years of age. Her and another little girl had had a disagreement, an argument. She was going home after school with her sisters. Her and this other little girl had exchanged words. And Ellen turned around to look. This girl was behind her. And when she turned around to look, this little girl had thrown a stone. And that stone struck her right in the forehead, right on the bridge of the nose, actually. The stone was big enough and heavy enough that it knocked her unconscious and knocked her to the ground. With the help of a man who owned a store close by, they were able to bring her back to consciousness. And her sisters helped her on home. But she was never able to go back to school. The little girl that had thrown the stone did all that she could do, as far as apologizing and all. But medical science being what it was, she was never able to go back to school. All she ever had was a third grade education. At the age of 12, she gave her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and was baptized in a Methodist church. From that point on, she tried to walk as close to the Lord as she understood how. At the age of 17, her and some other young ladies were praying. And as they were praying, she received a vision. In that vision, she saw some people walking a very narrow path. She noticed that the light shone on that path. And she noticed that as long as they walked in the path, in the light, they had no trouble seeing the path, but if they stopped, the light continued on and they were left in darkness. And some of them stumbled and fell off the path. Now, you and I don't have any trouble understanding that because the Scripture tells us that God's Word is a light unto our path. Okay, and that's the way it is. If you walk in the light as you understand it, you'll have no trouble if you refuse to walk in light as the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you're going to have trouble. You're going to be left in darkness. When she came out of that, she explained what she had seen to her friends. From that time on, she had numbers of visions. Sometimes when she was in vision, she had extraordinary strength. Once when she was in vision, she held that large family Bible at arm's length for over a half hour as she told about the texts that were being shown her in vision. I've held that Bible in my hand. I can't hold it out in arm's length for five minutes, let alone a half hour. Sometimes when she was in vision, she didn't breathe for as much as 30 and 40 minutes. They put a candle right to her mouth as she spoke and the flame would not even flicker. They put mirrors there, and there would be absolutely no breath that would form there on the mirror. There was no breath there at all. Many times, as God showed her things that were to happen or to take place, she told about them. In the course of her life, she wrote some 55 different books. I have read those books. I can tell you right now, I don't find them to be out of harmony with this book. I find them to be in harmony with it. I can't ask you to believe them. All I can ask you to do is to read it. And if you'll read some of those books, I think you'll be clearly convinced that she was led by God in a special way. For instance, she's written books on the Bible, one of my favorite is Desire of Ages on the Life of Christ. And by the way, I would like to recommend something to you. When you read her writings, you'll be much better off to read books that she wrote from cover to cover. You'll find the counsel is beautiful and clear as you read it, where she wrote it from cover to cover. She wrote books on health. She wrote books on education. In fact, there is a whole educational system today that exists based on what she wrote. In fact, there's a college right over here of medicine 
that was established based on what she wrote. There's another college right over here in La Sierra that was established based on what she wrote. There are schools all around the world that were established, the principles of education based on what a woman with a third grade education wrote. Not only did she write books on education, but she wrote books on health. And today, there are hospitals, clinics, medicine, schools of medicine, all established based on what she wrote about medicine. Now, I can read to you in her writings where she says, don't place my writings on a par with Scripture. She says, my writings are a lesser light to lead to the greater light of God's Word. She will tell you time and time again, I recommend to you the Word of God. But dear friend, I can tell you also, God hasn't run off and left us. He's given us all kinds of counsel, all the counsel that we need to make it into the kingdom of heaven. All you and I need to do is to sit down, begin to read and study God's Word, have a relationship with Jesus Christ, friend. I can tell you, when I pick up, pick up books like Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, and I read those books, the same gentle, loving spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ that I find in this book just comes through those books and invades my soul. I can't recommend them to you too highly. If you haven't read them, dear friend, get one. Open it up and read it. See what it does for your Christian experience as you read about it. You'll find that it'll just simply open your eyes and you'll see things like you've never seen before. Listen as Steve sings, Open My Eyes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, as we have seen how you have guided and directed and led men and women all the way down through time, oh Lord, we pray that each one here tonight may believe in the Lord their God and be established, that they may believe his prophets and prosper. May all of us follow, walk with thee, have a place in thy kingdom, not because we're worthy, but because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.